anyone who loses their vision for the future will always return to their past. You're not going to see God's will your way. You see God's will His way. And what the verses are actually teaching us is anchored hope is built on two infallible, immutable, unchangeable, unshakable things. Dreamers keep on dreaming. When our church was 10 years old, we're now 32 years old. I sat at a desk one day and I was inspired. I felt, you know, I just felt like I wanted to write down what was in me in terms of the dream for our church. And it's a kind of dream when you dream with your eyes closed, not open. I started to think about the church that I see. And slowly I began to write it down, the church that I see. It talked about a church where buildings would struggle to contain the increase. It talked a church where the city and the nation could not ignore it. I talked about many other things that relate to our church now, including television, the influence of the worship, the Hillsong International Leadership College, and all sorts of other things were there. But I have to tell you, it was audacious. It was almost embarrassing to show people because the church that we had right then, it was a good church. It was a medium church. It was kind of growing. It was a healthy church, but it looked nothing like what I put on that paper. But I dared to dream. And you know, by God's grace, anyone who knows that church that I see would be able to see in many ways today, it's more like a description of the church than we have than a church that is a dream for the future. And I tell you that only by the grace of God. But dreamers keep dreaming new dreams. So when our church reached 30 years old, went through exactly the same exercise and wrote at the top of the paper, the church that I now see and took time again and began to be just as audacious, just as outrageous, just as stretching, just as almost embarrassing to show people as I wrote down the church that I now see. And I have to tell you, it's grand and it's big and it's a long way from the church that we actually have. But I have learned in life that God causes dreams to come true. And I have learned in life the importance of never stop dreaming. Anyone, anyone, who loses their vision for the future will always return to their past. And that's why you should never stop dreaming. But spiritual activity is not always the same as spiritual life. I think sometimes as believers, people can be where you can detect a pulse just. You, you can detect a pulse, but they're hardly pulsating with spiritual life. You understand what I mean? I mean, let's be honest. I've been going to church all my life, born into the Salvation Army by the age of two, a Baptist. And by five, my father had become a Pentecostal pastor. And so all my life, and I know for myself that it can become learned behaviour. And learned behaviour is not spiritual life. Learned behaviour is, I know what Christians should do, what they shouldn't do, where I should go, where I shouldn't go, uh, what I should say, what I shouldn't say. We become very good at Christianese. We know the language, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. I mean, it's easy to get in the way of learning the language. But I wonder what it really means to be spiritually alive. When God breathed life into Adam, he breathed physical life into him, but he also breathed spiritual life into him. And I believe we're called not obviously just to be physically alive or not to be spiritually barely alive, but he wants us to be spiritually alive. And that's why I love that verse and that thought, spiritually alive. We have access to everything God's Spirit is doing, the Bible says. And everything. In everything, I will trust in you. There is hope in the promise of the cross. You gave everything to save the world you love. And this hope, not just any hope, this hope is an anchor for my soul. Our God shall stand unshakable. Do you know someone said, you can only live a certain amount of time without food. You can live a lot less time without water. But none of us were ever created to live without hope. Hope is so powerful. 
The devil would love to rip all hope away from us. But you know, not all hope is anchored hope. For example, you could drink too much and decide to drive home and hope you don't get caught by a policeman. That's unanchored hope. You could decide to take a lottery ticket and hope against hope you win the lottery. And I mean, you might, someone's got to win it. Might as well be you. But it's unanchored hope. But this is a different hope. We're singing about an anchored hope. Big difference between just a vain hope where we're hoping against hope and just somehow believing that somewhere in the midst of it all that one in a million chance might happen to me. An anchored hope is very different. And I find when I sometimes look at Scripture, for example, the verses around this particular verse here, Hebrews 6, 19, it all's very good, but you don't really, when you first look at it, often get the power and get the life out of it. And the verses leading up to this, it's something about an oath and something about Abraham, Father Abraham, and it kind of says good, and then it talks about two immutable things. Well, even that, that's a big word. And so we don't necessarily get the power. But the truth is, the word immutable means unchangeable. And what the verses are actually teaching us his anchored hope is built on two infallible, immutable, unchangeable, unshakable things. Because I believe you get what you go for, sadly, in life. When we go for all the wrong things, we tend also to get what we go for. You also get what you allow. So if it comes to the culture of your life, if it comes to those things that define your life and your behaviour, you get what you allow. So what are you going for? What do you allow? When it comes to those things that relate to the purpose of God, you get the fruit that comes from what you go for. But sadly, when it comes to destructive things, you may see the consequences of what you go for, or you may see the baggage that's attached to what you go for. So we should never underestimate the importance of our own ways, our own pursuits, and our own desires and never ever underestimate how those things in fact can cause the will of God to fade in your life, can draw you away. When the scripture here talks about being drawn away, it's a metaphor, it paints a picture literally of the bait on a fisherman's hook, which entices the fish and then the fisherman drags it away. What a wonder would it take to drag you away from all that God's got for you in life. We've all got our own quirky little ways. Idiosyncrasies, they call them. All of us have got our own ways. When you live with another person for a long time, you live with those idiosyncrasies as well. You kind of live with all of those funny ways. So I've got my funny ways. My wife, Bobby, she's got her funny ways. Well, we've all got our own ways. And you know, a lot of those ways are harmless. But when you live your life and you are way full, you are full of your own ways, Sadly, you're not going to see God's will your way. You see God's will His way. And we can be way filled. We can be filled with our own ways. But let's prove that we are trustworthy so that having done all, we will still stand. He wants to be able to trust you with His Word, with His power, with His promise. Here's some keys, I believe, to financial fitness. And the first one is simply right believing. Right believing. Right believing about God's will for you to bless you. Do you know something? People are so quick to reduce the blessing of God that was something for His Old Testament people and something for heaven. Somehow we got missed out. We got suspended in the gap. God wants to bless you, wants to crown with you life, but it's in eternity, it's in the afterlife. Or God blessed Abraham, the Abrahamic blessing on his Old Testament people. There was a whole lot of blessing there. Success belonged in the Old Testament. Prosperity belonged in the Old Testament. You know, it's sad that in church, you can use the word blessed, you can use the word uh, fruitful, but you can't use the word prosperity. They actually mean the same thing. Yeah. And prosperity is help for the journey. Prosperity is provision for the vision. 
Prosperity is not a pile of money necessarily. Prosperity can be spirit, soul and body. It's all about God's blessing in your life. Right believing is so important. Much more important than having money is having a right heart toward money. And you know, if you want right believing towards money, number one, you can't love it. The Bible never ever says money is the root of evil. It says the love of money. When ordinary people like you and I pray, something extraordinary is about to happen. There is nothing boring about prayer. Prayer is not something that we should look at as a, a task, something that is mundane. Your prayer doesn't have to be monotone, nor a monologue. It's not a monologue when you bring God into it. Prayer doesn't have to be one dimensional. There is a breadth and a width to prayer. James chapter five, verse 16 teaches us to confess our faults one to another. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails a bit. <laughs> avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature just like yours. Don't you get encouraged by that? You look at people like Elijah, this great man of God, Elijah, and you look at prayers and you think, oh, that I could pray the kind of prayers that Elijah prayed. And the good news is you can. Because the Bible describes Elijah as being just like you. Just like you. Elijah was a man with a nature just like you and just like me. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. And so Elijah was the kind of man who could pray the types of prayer that would either stop the rain or start the rain. Any farmer would love to have prayer ministry that Elijah had because he could bring the rain and he could stop the rain. And you think he must have been some sort of a spiritual giant. But Elijah was a man just like you and I with a nature just like ours. But he knew how to pray. And when you know how to pray, you know, we may be very ordinary people, but the power of prayer connects us to a very extraordinary God. Because when you pray, you encounter God. You have a God encounter. When you pray, you bring an extraordinary God into your very ordinary everyday life. When you pray, you confess your utter dependence Dependence on the Lord. When I pray, it's me saying, God, this is too big for me. This is more than I can do. And we pray, confessing our utter dependence on God. Prayer has power in the heavenlies. Every single one of us are going to have some seasons of tough, difficult challenges. You call them night seasons. And the one thing about nights is they're different than daytimes. I mean, for a start, you can't see where you're going in the night. Easy to get lost. Fear breeds in the night. Anxiety breeds in the night. You ever notice that things even always seem a little worse in the middle of the night than they do in the daytime? You wake up and think, oh, why was I so worked up about that? Just seems worse in the nighttime. So many things breed in the night. Loneliness breeds in the night. Confusion breeds in the night. You start seeing things in the night. When I was a little kid, I can remember there'd be a coat or something hanging on a wall and I'd be so convinced that there was someone in my room and I'd be so far down and under my blankets hiding from what it was just a coat on the wall. But you see, that's the whole thing. Your heart instructs you in the night season and your heart can only instruct you according to what it knows. And so sadly, many people, when they meet life's challenges, they can walk out of a college like this and they're so full of faith and so full of vision, but if it didn't really impact the condition of your heart, when the tough times do come, when the challenge does come, when maybe things don't work out quite as quickly or quite as well as you expected, your heart can only instruct you according to what it knows. And when you can't see like you can't see in the nighttime, then many people lose their way sadly and get, find their way off course because they never ever really allowed the things they learned to change the condition of their heart. Students, you got so much gift and so much talent. you got so much potential. The call of God on your life is undoubted. That part's 100% certain that you're created for such a time as this. 
There's not going to be the things of God. It's not going to be enemies. It's not going to be things coming against you naturally. It's not going to be the person who let you down. It's not going to be the pastor who promised you the world and then gave you zero. It's not going to be all of those things that will define your life. It's going to be what really you allow to happen on the inside. If I go on in this verse... David, who said, the lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. He goes on and says, I have set the Lord always before me. So from my heart instructs me in the night seasons, I have set the Lord. His heart was instructing him according to the way it was set. And that's why even in all of his challenge, he was able to see life from the perspective of all the lions keep falling for me in pleasant places. I have a good inheritance because of the way his heart was set. As I read your book and you tell the story of your father, yes. I mean, my heart just went out to you. Share a little bit of that story. Yeah. Well, growing up, my dad was uh, a very prominent pastor in your hero, really. Australia, New Zealand, yeah. absolutely my hero. And in fact, I used to watch him go off to preach somewhere. Uh, and I, I, I just always thought, one day I want to do that, one day yeah. I want to do that. So when I was 45, I'm 61 now, uh, my father... Uh, was overseas and one of the key people on my team, on my staff, we had our normal weekly conversation, you know, our, our discussion. And at the end, he said, oh, Brian, there's just one more thing. He said, it's, it's about your father. And just the tone, the way he said it, uh, you know, I just sensed there was something going to be wrong. So, but what he told me, I could never have imagined. He, he told me that a, a complaint had come in that 30 years or so before that, back in the 1970s, that my father was being accused of abusing a young uh, a child. Uh, yeah, it yeah. was the worst day of my life. I talk about it in my book because, you know, I just really believe we help people through our tough times and through our good times. Yeah. And so I had to confront my own father and uh, ask him. You had to ask him to step down. Pardon? You had to ask him oh, to yes, step I, down. I had to fire him, yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How did God meet you in that dark place? Because I can't imagine. I mean, as I read the book, I, I tried to put myself in your position to have someone go from being your hero to doing something so desperately unimaginable to yeah. you. I, I just couldn't even comprehend the, the issue of emotion that must have coursed through you. How yeah. did you handle that? Well, you know, it's now 15 years on since I learned that and uh, 16 years on. But to be honest, it's, it's still a journey. I mean, it was yeah. horrific. I can't think of too much worse than finding out that your father was, was a paedophile. And so, yeah, you know, it's, still, it's still an ongoing journey. But I've never doubted the grace of God. I've never, ever doubted yeah. that God is bigger, that yeah. God is greater and that he could sustain me. Yeah. And so that's what keeps you going forward. And Bobby features quite strongly in the book as well, which of course you can imagine that. And I mean, you guys have been married, what, over 40 years now? Yeah, 41. Congratulations. Thank you. I wonder, because she obviously has her own personal vision and she's obviously pursued that really strongly. But if she hadn't shared your vision for what you wanted to do with your life, I feel like this all could have been a very different story. If there's someone watching who has a family where they feel like, I feel like my, you know, my family's holding me back or, or, or that kind of perspective. Yeah. How do you get your family on board with your dream and vision? Look, I think for Bobby and I, honestly, if you were to ask what's you know been our marriage, our marriage tips, you know what's what's kept our marriage strong. Honestly, being together in vision has been the strongest thing. I think two people can have totally different careers. One could be working in a church situation, and the other completely in you know a professional role somewhere out there in a secular world. But that's not the issue. The issue is that our heart and our purpose and our calling are in the same direction. And if you get that, then I feel number one, it will keep you, you know, when everything else fails, you've got something to keep you together. But on top of that, uh, you know, you, you build a family that's going in one direction. It's, it's very difficult when people are trying to juggle, you know, my personal life and my Christian life and my church life and my this life. So the best thing people can do is decide it's all about serving Jesus. And when we make that decision, everything's going in the same direction. To be told that you have potential is like life changing. Just the culture of welcome home, a culture of community, a culture of you belong. That has been amazing for me. How fundamental the church has been in my now understanding of family.
You know, this church has changed my life. It's where I met my wife. It's where I've really grown in my faith. And so on a practical level, for the Indonesian who goes to a local church in Bali, for me, the kid from South London who goes to a campus in Bermondsey, what does it mean for the individual to find their place? <laughs> when we first ever built our very first building, one thing Bobby was very intentional about and very determined to do was greet everybody with a sign saying, welcome home. Today, we still see that as our goal, yeah. that when people walk through that door, they feel this sense of, well, I'm, I'm accepted here, I'm, I'm at home. I think people who know um, the, the core message of our church, the bottom line is that it's a family. A healthy family, there's going to be a place for everybody. And um, I think that actually defines what is this ministry that is one house, many rooms. Yeah. And I think through community, through smaller groups, through uh, really focusing on that side you know, of church where everyone feels important, everyone feels special and involved, is always our goal. To not just make it about crowds, but to make it about individuals. One of the bigger campuses of our church is the Hills Campus in Sydney. Yet despite its sprawling size, it still somehow manages to connect individuals on a very personal level and keep that sense of family. Wow, Brian Houston is really amazing inspiration pastors. And who doesn't like Hillsong worship? We have been doing this series for over two years and we have over 40 episodes. I want to ask you, what episodes you most like or most bring breakthrough for your life? Please put in comments. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. See you in the next episode.